could hear that countdown. I mean, I could hear you counting them down. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, ladies and germs, boys and girls. This is James Spann. Today, we're going to talk about science. Yeah, the science of weather, meteorology. If you're new to this, this is our third online session since all of this started. We're going to keep doing this every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern through mid-May. And today, the focus is going to be on tornadoes. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. But my question to you guys is, what have you been doing? I mean, are you driving your parents crazy? Are your brothers or sisters driving you crazy? Well, I thought I'd show you what I've been doing. I've been working on my skin complexion. And somebody told me that you're really not supposed to put those cucumbers on top of your glasses. They go actually on your eyes. That didn't work out very well. So I thought I'd grow some facial hair. That just didn't work out. So I don't know. But let's go to the span can. You know what? I'm working from home like everybody else. I'm hanging out at the house like you. I'm doing all of my television weather reports from home, radio, everything I do. And so I thought I'd put a camera in the backyard. And goodness, on a day like today where I am, down here in the deep south, the weather could not be better. I mean, if you listen carefully from time to time, you might hear some birds chirping. Ah, that is a cobalt blue sky. And before you know it, we're going to be in those long, hot summer days where it's hazy and the sky has that milky appearance. So look, go go sit down out in the yard and look up sometimes. You, you might see some cirrus clouds floating by today. I love to watch the sky, and that's the one thing with a little more time on my hands, I've been able to do that. All right, so uh, let's start with what the actual planet looks like today. Love to look at these full disk satellite images. This is a composite taken a couple of hours ago, and the planet's looking pretty good. And by the way, you won't believe this, but we're coming up on a big anniversary. In fact, we just had one. This was yesterday, 60 years ago yesterday. Guess what we saw for the first time? Weather satellite pictures. This was the very first weather satellite picture from over the Earth's equator taken April 1st. 1960 from the satellite that was known as Tyros 1. Now, now look at that satellite, okay? And again, let me go back to what we have today. Boy, have we come a long way. Science is awesome. We cannot thank our friends at NASA enough for what they do in aerospace engineering and getting our satellites into orbit. So that is just absolutely incredible. And by the way, down below that, all kind of weather is happening. I have to show you what's happening in South Dakota. Wow, this was taken late last night, early this morning, and they are in the midst of a big snowstorm. Yeah, winter is hanging tight for some parts of the United States. Some people like the snow. Some people don't. I kind of do because it doesn't snow a lot where I am. But again, the focus today, it's not going to be on snow. We'll talk about that at another time. The focus is on tornadoes. I want to go in the way back machine, and I mean the way back machine. On this date, April 2nd, 1957, this tornado came through Dallas, Texas. I used to work in Dallas a long time ago, worked for Channel 4. I was a chief meteorologist. Back then, it was the CBS channel, and uh, no, I didn't experience this tornado, but boy, a lot of people remember it, older people. This was coming through the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, south of downtown Dallas. It passed a little to the west of downtown and finally lifted about the location of Love Field Airport. And this, at the time, at the time, one of the most photographed tornadoes on record. People shot video, as you can see here. They took pictures. And it really initiated a lot of research into why tornadoes happen, what they can do, what can we do to make people safer when tornadoes do happen. And by the way, this tornado was rated. Every tornado gets a number. All of you watching, you have an age. I'm not going to tell you my age. It would take too long to calculate that. But you have a number. Well, tornadoes have a number. And it is ranked on a scale of zero to five. This tornado was a three. The weakest tornado is an EF zero. The biggest is an EF five. And again, this was rated an EF three. And back in 1957, there weren't tornado warnings and there weren't tornado watches and people didn't know this was happening. But again, that I can't imagine it. That came through Dallas today. Think about how big Dallas, Texas is today compared to what it was like back in 1957. But this is our scale. So the smallest tornado, 
an EF0. The wind, 65 to 85 miles an hour. And listen, you're probably thinking, eh, that's no big deal. It actually is a big deal. Trust me, if that thing goes through your neighborhood, you'll find out what a big deal an EF0 tornado is. But the big ones, those EF5s, those pack winds in excess of 200 miles per hour. I have no idea what that's like. You know why? I've never been in one, and there's a good chance you've never been in one either. They really don't happen that often. In fact, let me show you a chart of tornadoes based on the EF scale. Most tornadoes, most tornadoes, 57% are the little ones, EF0. And man, that's good news. And most of the other ones are EF1s. So uh, most of the tornadoes that we deal with are EF0s and EF1s. Hardly any of them are EF4s and EF5s, only about one out of 100. So the next question people have, where do tornadoes happen? Now, there's a good chance if you're watching this, you're probably in the United States, although we know that some of you are watching globally. Well, tornadoes do happen in other parts of the world. This is a map of tornado occurrence globally, and you can see that, yes, the United States, we have tornadoes. Canada, yes, absolutely, North America. But tornadoes also happen in parts of South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. So understand, this is not just an occurrence in the United States. So where do they happen in the United States? And by the way, I love maps. If I told you that before, I mean I love maps. In a normal day, like today, I'll see about, oh, 150, 200 maps. And on really busy days, I might see a lot more than that. And you really need to understand geography to really be good at meteorology. So one thing I show, I show a lot of maps, okay? So let's go back to this map. This is where tornadoes happen, mostly in the United States. Uh, this is data from the mid-1980s up until 2015. The mean number of tornado days per year within 25 miles of a point. The darker shades, that's where tornadoes happen, and they happen most often from the Gulf Coast region up through parts of the middle of the country, the Great Plains. And those darker shades, that's where they really happen a good bit. So the Great Plains, states like Oklahoma and Kansas and the eastern Colorado. And then the other region is down in the deep south, Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana. Really two distinct places. We call that Great Plains area traditional tornado alley. And down in the deep south, that's called Dixie Alley. But let me show you where the really big tornadoes happen. Okay, this is the number of EF4 and EF5 tornado days per century within 25 miles of a given point. And you can see that the big bullseye is down there in Dixie Alley, parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. But big tornadoes can happen across traditional tornado alley as well. So that's where they happen. Now, when do they happen? So this is a map of tornado probabilities in mid-March. And in the middle of March, it's mostly Dixie Alley, Alabama, Mississippi, and some of the adjacent states. Let's go to the first part of April. Basically, this is where we are now. It begins to expand, but still, most of the tornadoes across the southern states. Let's go to the first part of May. Uh-huh, begins to shift to the west. Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. And by the time we get to June, the tornado maximum is moving north up toward the high plains. So it shifts every month this during the year. And I had to show you this. This is around Thanksgiving. Uh, parts of the Deep South, Dixie Alley, they have another tornado season in November and December. So that's when they happen. And how do they form? Well, first off, I've got good news. Tornadoes don't happen a lot. That's the greatest news of all. Uh, they have to happen from a thunderstorm. That's a developing thunderstorm. And I, I've love to watch these cloud time-lapse videos like this. But you can't have a tornado without a thunderstorm. In fact, let me go back to the uh, span cam. Let's see if we can hear a bird chirping. Sometimes they're loud, sometimes they're not. Guess what? We're not going to have a tornado in span land today. You know why? There's not a cloud in the sky. The air is bone dry, no clouds, no thunderstorms, no tornadoes. Now, you might have a little dust devil that's a small vortex on the ground that's not related to a tornado. Those can happen on a clear day. But I'm talking tornadoes. No. You have to have a thunderstorm to have a tornado. And within that thunderstorm, you need the winds to change direction. 
down at the low levels, the winds are typically out of the southeast, and the high levels, they're out of the west, and that sets the updrafts into motion. And before you know it, you can have some problems. Let me show you this cool video about tornado formation. What causes a tornado? The swirling, funnel-shaped winds of a tornado are easily recognizable, and they can be very dangerous. But what causes these unique and violent weather phenomena? Tornadoes usually begin with a thunderstorm, but not just any thunderstorm, a specific kind of rotating thunderstorm called a supercell. They can bring damaging hail, strong winds, lightning, and flash floods. Supercells form when air becomes very unstable and wind speed and direction are different at different altitudes. This condition is called wind shear. Wind shear is common in the formation of most thunderstorms. When wind at ground level is blowing in one direction and wind higher up in the atmosphere blows in a different direction, it can cause a horizontal tube of air to form. In a thunderstorm, warm air rises up within the storm. This is called an updraft. An updraft can turn a horizontal rotating tube of air into a vertical one. When this happens, the whole storm begins rotating, creating a supercell. Some supercells form a funnel cloud. And if that funnel cloud extends to the ground, it's called a tornado. Tornadoes can produce winds up to 300 miles per hour at the surface, making them dangerous to people and property. As a tornado moves along the ground, its strong winds begin to pick up debris too. In fact, flying debris is usually what causes the most damage in a storm. Thankfully, meteorologists are keeping an eye on your local weather. They will try to give you a heads up if a tornado is likely to form in your area. They combine wind and temperature readings from the ground with information from satellites to determine if your local weather has the right conditions for a tornado. For example, NOAA's Goes East satellite captured this video of an isolated supercell storm in Texas. The different colors represent different cloud top temperatures in the storm. Colder temperatures represent higher cloud tops, which often means stronger storms. So, if you see a tornado watch or warning in your area, look for updates and get to safety as soon as possible. And know that NOAA's GOES-R series satellites will still be keeping a close eye on things from orbit. Find out more about extreme weather at NOAA SciJinx. And we are so happy to have our partners being NOAA. Those are our friends that work for the federal government, and they work for the National Weather Service, and they do a lot of research. They do things like I do. They help to develop the satellites, and, of course, NASA, our buddies there, they get the rockets that put them into orbit. So we are so thankful for them. But, again, I've got to show this fantastic video. This is a simulation of an EF-5 tornado. Check this out. This is from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Again, I could watch that all day. That's amazing to me. So that's how tornadoes are formed. Now, the question is, what do you do about them? You saw a little bit in that video about how we're warned. One of the key f places when it comes to warning for tornadoes, it's this place, the National Weather Center. This is in Norman, Oklahoma. 
not too far from the campus of the University of Oklahoma, where they have a world-class meteorology program there. It's a little south of Oklahoma City. I've been there many times before. And this is where the Storm Prediction Center is located. These men and women, these brilliant scientists, and really, they're good. They are our Army Rangers, our Navy SEALs, the best of the best. They are on 24-7 watch, monitoring the atmosphere to determine if conditions become favorable for tornadoes. If there's a lot of moisture in the low levels, if the air is buoyant, the air parcels are rising, if there's wind shear, the winds change with direction. And every day, every day, no matter if the weather's good or bad across the country, they issue severe weather outlooks. And I want to teach you guys these outlooks. This is important for everybody. In fact, you might help me by teaching your parents how this works, okay? Every day, you're going to have a risk of storms if there's a chance of storms. Well, first off, you might have storms that aren't severe. And by the way, to be severe, storm, you should know this by now. You've been to a couple of these online weather schools. Only two things can make a storm severe. Number one, it's hail. The hail has to be one inch in diameter. That's the size of a quarter. And the only other way a storm can be severe is what? High wind. How many miles per hour must the wind be blowing in a storm for a storm to be severe? The right answer is 58 miles per hour. So that's the definition of a severe storm. The lowest level is that dark green, level one. I like the numbers. We've got one, two, three, four, five. The lowest level severe weather risk is level one, dark green. There might be a severe storm, but most people won't have one. When you go to yellow, level two, a lot of our bad weather days are level two days. We're going to have some scattered severe storms. After that comes level three. That's called enhanced. Next up is level four. That's moderate. And you don't want to see that purple kind of day. That's level five out of five, a high risk. You don't see those that often. In fact, you might see a high risk one or two days a year, and that's it, thankfully. So let me show you today's severe weather outlook. And if you're watching this later, this was recorded on Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. And this was prepared by meteorologists at the Storm Prediction Center. And uh, looks like a very small level one out of level five marginal risk today for a small part of Oklahoma and Kansas. And that's about it, that darker green. The lighter shades of green, that means there could be some thunderstorms there, but severe weather is not expected. So the bottom line is today should be a fairly quiet day, which quite frankly is a little odd because typically in early April we have some severe weather somewhere. So here's my next question for you. Do you understand the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning? It's amazing to me how many people still get this confused. So let me teach you, and again, you might help me by teaching your parents. So a tornado watch means conditions are favorable for tornadoes, and a tornado is possible. They typically last four, five, or six hours, and there's no need to do anything if there's a tornado watch except to pay close attention. Be sure you can hear other weather information. Now, the most important message, it's a tornado warning. That means a tornado is imminent. Either we see one on radar or people are actually looking at one. And that's when you go to your safe place immediately. If you're in the polygon, we use these geometric shapes called polygons to warn people. And you respect the polygon when there's a warning. And the watches are issued by the Storm Prediction Center, but the warnings are issued by local National Weather Service offices all across the country. This is the National Weather Service in Birmingham, Alabama. This is where I am. And like the Storm Prediction Center, they are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're there on Christmas. They are there on the 4th of July, and they work hard to always monitor the weather. And they're the folks that issue the warnings that you see on television or hear on the radio. And they do a great job, and it's hard. A lot of people think, oh, I could issue those warnings. Well, you might want to try and sit in that chair and see how hard it is because you don't want false alarms, but you want to be sure that you warn for every single tornado. And the big, big instrument we use to detect tornadoes, you know what that is. It's this. What is that? No, it's not a volleyball. This is weather radar. 
And I, I bet you've driven by one of these things and you didn't even notice it. Or maybe you saw it, you didn't know it's in there. Well, inside that ball, there's a really big antenna that's constantly spinning around all day, shooting out little beams of electromagnetic energy. And if a beam of energy strikes a raindrop, it will bounce off the raindrop and bounce back to the antenna. We make maps where the bounces are coming from, and my maps look like this. Now, I showed you this last week and the week before, I think, so I'm going to give you a test. Let's see if you can pick out the tornado. This is a violent supercell thunderstorm, and there is a tornado. This was a large tornado in this storm. This was on April 27, 2011. All right, I'll give you a second. Everybody take a look. Pick out a spot on the screen. You got this. You know where that tornado is. It's down there at the end of the hook in that little spot of red and white. There's no heavy rain there. That was, In fact, there wasn't much rain at all. That was the radar beam bouncing off debris being lofted up into the tornado. Things like tree limbs and boards and bricks and glass and nails. And I mentioned that this was on a day nine years ago. This was April 27, 2011. In my state, on that one day, we had 62 tornadoes in one day. Now, let me just tell you, first off, this doesn't happen a lot. This is what we call generational. This means something like this tends to happen about once every 40 years. It's happened before, and it's going to happen again. But it just doesn't happen a lot. We had a day like that here in 1932, had a day like that in 1974, and then we had 2011. So 62 tornadoes in one day. Imagine that. And a lot of you, this was before you were born, but this was a historic day. And again, you see our rating. Look over there on the left. You see those numbers. You know what those numbers mean. That's the enhanced Fujita scale. The weakest tornado is a zero. The biggest is a, yeah, five. You got that. We had three fives on this day, three purple lines. Two were side by side up in northwest Alabama, and we had one over in the northeastern part of the state. And to have three fives in one day, that is so rare. And wow, we had a lot of fours, all those red lines. In fact, let me show you one of our fours that day. Uh, this is going to become an EF4 tornado. This is live on television. And this tornado is approaching a town where about 25,000 people live. And the creeper that you see on that screen right now, that would be me. All I'm doing is standing in front of a green wall. Looks like it's back there. But this is a bad tornado, but it's really a good story. Again, over 20,000 people live in this town, but everybody was okay. They heard the warning. And again, you know this now because we taught you this. The message we use when a tornado is coming is called a tornado warning. And the people heard it. They knew how to get the message. They turned on the TV, and there it is. They didn't have to look out the window or walk out in the front yard. We know that people want to see it, and a lot of times you can't see it. That's important to understand. Many tornadoes happen at night. Many tornadoes you can't see because of hills and trees. Many tornadoes are wrapped in rain. But this one you could see, and we could show it live on television. So people saw it, and they went right to a safe place, and they got there. And again, this was really bad. Was there bad damage? Absolutely. But you know what? If you drive through this town today, it's a lovely place called Cullman, Alabama. Most people would never know this happened. Now, if you live there, you know that it happened. But we can rebuild a school, a church, a house, a business, but we just have to be sure that you are okay. Later in the day, this is a tornado coming up on Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Again, you can see the hook and the debris ball in the radar picture, and this is a live video, live on television that day, about 5.15 of an EF4. This is a big one coming through the southern part of the city of Tuscaloosa. And this is pretty hard to watch. Guys, I don't like to watch this. And by the way, all of this is on YouTube. If you'd like to watch coverage of this day or other videos from this day, there's some remarkable images on YouTube. Uh, I don't necessarily spend a lot of time looking at this. I I've taken all the data I need from this day and we had that. We've done research on it. And uh, I moved to Tuscaloosa when I was uh, started fifth grade. And this is a very special place for me. This was a time in my life where times were kind of hard. And there were some wonderful people that loved us and encouraged us and helped us. But this is ground video coming from John Brown and Mike Wilhelm of this big EF4 tornado coming through Tuscaloosa. And if you look carefully, you'll see some debris that's being lofted. Again, things from the ground are being taken up. That's a violently rotating updraft. And that's what it looked like from the ground. And again, I can't tell you enough that you will not see most tornadoes. 
the tempting thing to do when there's a tornado warning, you're in the polygon, it's to what? Go look for it. And I understand that, that's human nature, but that doesn't make any sense. That wastes time that you could be using getting to a safe place. Now, this tornado stayed on the ground for a long time. This was what we call a long track tornado. Understand, most tornadoes last for a few minutes and they are gone. They're tiny, they're EF zeros. Some are down for maybe one minute or two minutes and they're gone. This was a violent long track tornado. This stayed on the ground for a long, long time. In fact, that same tornado would move all the way from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham along the path. Now, this is what it looked like from Birmingham, and you can't see it. Why? It's all wrapped in rain. That's what most tornadoes look like in Dixie Alley. Out in the Great Plains, they're drier storms, and often you can see them, but that was still that EF4 tornado coming through parts of the city of Birmingham. This is coming through a part of the city of Birmingham called Pratt City, and that was awfully hard to see. In fact, you can't see it. All you're looking at is rain. So the question is, what do you do? And let me, let me stress this one more time. We, I know there are a lot of boys and girls that are afraid of these things. They're afraid of them. I don't want you to be afraid of weather. I taught you this a couple of weeks ago. Storms are good. We need them. They are a vital part of the water cycle. If we don't have storms, we don't have water in a lot of places. And if you don't have water, you can't live there. Storms are good. We need them. And hardly any of them, hardly any of them produce a tornado. It's like a fire. Fires don't happen a lot. I'm not afraid of a fire. If we ever have one, I know what to do. Stop, drop, and roll. Yeah, you know that. And all you have to do is just know what to do if we ever have a tornado and you'll be fine. And if you're younger, listen, your parents know what to do. Your teachers at school know what to do. Teachers are absolute heroes. And I hope any teacher watching this, I just wanted to thank you for what you do. I'm a little jealous because I've said this before. If I didn't do television weather, guess what I would be? Guess what I would do for a living? I want to be a third grade science teacher. Those are my people. So let's talk about safety. Let me show you a, some, some pictures of tornado damage. And the key thing, you got to be in a small room. Everybody's got a small room. I mean, think about your house. You got a small room, you got a bathroom, a hall, a closet. If you go in those places, you are as snug as a bug in a rug. Here's a house hit by a tornado. The, the roof is gone. The walls are gone. This was a big EF4, but they were fine. They were sitting in the hall. Every hall was fine. Every closet, every bathroom. I was there. I saw it. Here's a business. They were fine. They were in the hall. Anywhere else, you might have been hurt. And remember, a lot of people live in mobile homes. And for people that live in mobile homes, you have to leave. And your parents and you and all your family, you need to sit down and talk about that because you just can't stay there. And you go to a shelter or maybe a business that's open 24 hours a day and you'll be fine. This is some of the uh, damage from a tornado that came through Tuscaloosa. This is the one that you saw on television. And as bad as it looks, in most every house you see down below, there was a good, safe place. And the ones that heard the warning, they got there and they're just fine. The ones that got in trouble that day never heard the warning. So we want to be sure that you can hear warnings. That's very, very important to us. Uh, and but look, we know you're busy. You are not doing weather all day and all night like we do. You don't have time to pay attention to weather. That's what we do. We got your back. But when the weather gets dangerous, you do need to kind of stay focused and pay close attention. And this is what we want every home to have. If you have tornadoes a lot where you live, it's this. And I hope you have one. Do you know what that is? That is called a NOAA, N-O-A-A, -A, weather radio. That's like a smoke alarm in your house for tornadoes. Everybody's got a smoke alarm because it's the law. But most people don't have one of these. And they're very important. Listen, I have one here at my house. Because typically during tornado weather, I'm at work at the TV station, and I'm on television. I can't call my family, but I know they get the message because they have that NOAA weather radio. And if you get a warning, you know the deal. Here are my rules again. Small room, lowest floor. Don't go up, go down, and you don't have to be in a basement. You don't. If you don't have a basement, you're fine. Just the lowest level. Near the center of the house, put as many walls between you and the outside as you can, and away from windows, and we'll be fine. Never, ever, ever be afraid of tornadoes, okay? So uh, before we go, I, I've got some questions here. Let, let's, uh, 
Let's roll a few of those and see if we can find an answer. Hi, Mr. Spoon. My name is Lily Francella, and I go to Bridge Elementary School in Lexington, Mass. My question today is, what makes the color of the rainbow after a rainstorm? Ooh, I love rainbows. And anytime I see a rainbow, somehow I will stop my car if I'm driving, get out safely, and just start watching and taking pictures. Uh, rainbows are awesome. And uh, this is the deal. To have a rainbow, you really need to have a rain shower, some rain around. What happens, the sunlight goes through raindrops, and you get a refraction process that splits the sunlight into different colors, making the rainbow. And I hope you know, I hope everybody watching this knows the colors of the rainbow in the right order. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and say it, violet. Yeah, come on. You, you learn this in elementary school, I hope, or maybe you will learn it. Roy G. Biv, that will crawl up in your mind, that will be there until you're an old person like me. Those are the colors I just taught you in the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. All right, let's find another question. Hello, Mr. Swan. My name is Sophia, and I am eight years old. I live in Trustville, Alabama. I was wondering... How did a tornado get its name? And why do hurricanes have eyes? Bye. Thank you for doing this as well. We're all stuck at home. I love how Sophia's sister, she was admiring her hands and, and so well behaved during that question. Uh, great question. Yeah, we're stuck at home. Yeah, I understand that. So uh, what tornado, where did that name come from? Well, believe it or not, this was actually before my time. The origin of the word tornado goes back a long way to the Spanish language. Tronar, to thunder. That, we think that's the origin of the word tornado. And that kind of morphed out of a couple of other words. Tornar, which is to turn, and then tronada, which means thunderstorm, into tornado. And we think that word came along in the mid-16th century. That's a long time ago, so it's been around for an awfully long time. And your other question was about the eye of a hurricane. And let me just say one thing about weather. I think it's important to say there's a lot we don't know. And, and let me just say this right up front. I need some of you watching this that really like weather to get into our science when you go to college. Listen, some of you girls watching this, some of you boys are going to work in science one day, hopefully mine. The science of weather is called meteorology. And, and I promise with all my heart by the time you get to college, there will be a whole lot to learn because as I get older, and I've been doing this over 40 years, I'm understanding how much we don't know. And there's a lot we don't know about hurricane formation and why that eye happens. I do firmly believe a lot of the eye formation is related to the Coriolis force. The earth is spinning. The earth is spinning and spinning and spinning. It never stops. We're tilted on an axis. And because the earth is spinning, it deflects the winds a little bit. It's called the Coriolis force. And I think that's part of the reason the winds are deflected, the stronger winds away, and that helps to create that eye. But eye formation is still a great mystery, and not all hurricanes have eyes. The weaker hurricanes or disorganized hurricanes don't have one. The ones you're seeing here, yeah, these are very well-organized eyes. In fact, that was a close-up look at the eye of Hurricane Dorian that was near the Bahamas, and the bad part about that thing, it just sat there. I mean, it sat there for hours and hours and hours. And the eye is an amazing thing. Uh, in the eye, it's calm. Uh, basically, if you look up, you can see blue sky and sunshine, which is just absolutely remarkable. In fact, let me show you a photograph taken by hurricane hunters. This was in Dorian last year, and that's the eye. Look at the deep blue sky and the sunshine up there. This is a Hurricane Hunter plane about 10,000 feet off the ground. But you see the wall of clouds. That is called the eye wall. And that is the worst, the worst part of the storm. But this is the airplane they fly into hurricanes. That's a C-130. 
And there are other types of airplanes, aircraft use as well. But this is what they fly out of Keesler Air Force Base down in Biloxi, Mississippi. And they do a great job. When they get in there, they uh, take the weather packages like we send up on the weather balloons we've talked about here. But they drop them down that tube and they drop down to the ocean and they do a great job. In fact, what I'm going to do next week on the next session, we're going to talk about hurricanes. Uh, Hurricanes are entirely different critters compared to tornadoes. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about about hurricanes. It is a fascinating subject. So next week, the topic is going to be hurricanes, and we'll do it next Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, and for those that don't have social media that can't watch this, uh, we'll have it posted on YouTube later in the day. So boys and girls, thank you for your time. You are so nice to sit here and watch these videos with me. I really appreciate that because I miss being in schools. Uh, If this were a normal time of the year, I'd be in a school every day, one or two schools doing things like this. So thank you guys so much for watching today, and we will see you next week as we talk about hurricanes.